Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Uh, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. We're going to learn about Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey together. And this would be Paul's first one particularly. And I do want to show you a map here real quick, too, of an idea of how much he traveled um, in this first journey. It's, it's intense. And so if you would bring that, that picture up, we have a little map for you to show you. Uh, he, he was everywhere. And so he would be in Antioch, and then he would make his way down and go all the way back up, kind of do a circle, and then head back to Antioch of Syria. And uh, so he was busy. There's another Antioch of Pisidia up there on the left. We're going to read about that today. But Paul was called to be a missionary to the Gentiles, to those who were not Jews. And of course, he would preach to Jews as well. And so we see his first journey was pretty busy. And, and the call to be a missionary is, is definitely not for the faint of heart. It's definitely a challenge. But I do want to encourage you not to count yourself out of this scripture today. One, God could call you to be a missionary and travel the world. But two, we are all called to walk across the street and share our faith. To walk across the office. To walk across the classroom, wherever it may be, and share. You know, and in our community, we're meant to be missionaries for God wherever we are. And it usually begins there. And then people are even called into full-time ministry. And we're going to see the importance of being in, in a, a strong time with the Lord, the importance of being in his presence. We're going to see how the Spirit leads. We're going to see that the gospel isn't always accepted. It's actually rejected as well, that you're going to face, um, you're going to face resistance from the world as well. We're going to learn a lot today. But don't, do not be discouraged by any of that. We're also going to see that the gospel prevails and the church continues to reach many, many people. So are you ready? We had quite a bit of scripture to cover, and I pray that it would encourage you and strengthen you. I do pray that your heart grows in seeing the lost, but also that you are capable of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ to the lost, to those who need him. Through the scripture. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manian, and Saul. One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So, after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. Let's park here for a moment. We see that Paul and Barnabas are in prayer, worship, and fasting, most likely also meditating on Scripture as well. They often did this when they got together. We see that these are church leaders, teachers and prophets that were in Antioch at this time. And we see that the Holy Spirit prompted or initiated the call to go and start their first missionary journey. Now, at this time... Yes, people went around and they preached the gospel, but this will be the first time that now they're going to plant churches as they go. So it's, it's not just, let me share my faith here, here, and here. They began to plant assemblies or fellowships or churches. The word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia, which means fellowship. So it's a fellowship of believers that make a church. So you are the church, just so you know. This building is a place we call church, but you are the church. It's not a place of brick and mortar. It's actually you. And when, when the believers come together in fellowship, we are the ecclesia. We are the church of Jesus Christ. So welcome to the church of Jesus Christ. All right? Not just Calvary. Now, it's important that we understand that some people are called into full-time ministry, and there's a lot of prerequisites that go to this, one being... And in this case, being missionaries and church planners, one being that they were already practicing in the church leadership. They were already involved in ministry. I, 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 would, I would love to see people go from never serving God to all of a sudden they're a missionary, but that doesn't happen that way. 
These men first served God, and because they were faithful in serving, God called them out to now go and be in full-time ministry. It's okay. You're okay. Yep, cool. So anyway, so they're going to be called into full-time ministry. Just give them a moment. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, it's all right. God bless you. Okay. So they're going to be called into full-time ministry. So there's a serving that takes place that goes along in this. And then God begins to call. God begins to uh, uh, appoint and set apart people. Now, here's the thing. It's not human initiative. It's spirit initiative. This is important. We don't self-appoint ourselves to go be missionaries or be pastors or do ministry, especially full-time. The Lord calls us out. So if you've been considering that, it needs to be led by God, not by your, your own uh, ambition, so to say. Now, God will plant a desire in your heart. And what happens in this scripture is now the Holy Spirit confirms it through other prophets and teachers. What did they do? They laid their hand on them and prayed for them to send them out. So there's this approval from the church body, from the leadership. Let me say this too. And I want to just be careful with something. Okay, I'm not saying you're going to leave Calvary and some, find some other church in Dover. But just in case you do, or in case you move away from Calvary and you go to some other place, I want to, I want to give you a warning on something. Be careful of going to a church where there is no oversight, no leadership, no covering of a board, be careful of that. Yes. Many, many people have started cults because they believe they were the next best thing. They had no covering. They had no leadership to confirm their calling to start a church. They start a church and they sway people in the wrong way and they manipulate and they use their power and position to do that. Be warned that this is not what's happening here. There was covering over them and confirmation from the leaders of the church and the Holy Spirit's confirmation because once they felt the call, heard the call from the Holy Spirit, what did they do? They started praying and fasting again just to make sure. Self-appointed leaders, be careful. I have a covering over me. I'm part of the Assemblies of God Fellowship. I have authority over me that confirmed my call. Someone put a soul over my neck and put a hand on me and laid hands on me and said, you are sent, you are Danes, okay? Yeah. And by the way, I did, I did that in fearful trembling and reverence in the Lord because I knew what that meant. Because teachers will be judged stricter than others who are not teachers, according to scripture. So I just want to warn you, look out because there's wolves in sheep's clothing in leadership positions. Okay. All right, cool. I'm glad we're on the same page. <laughs> Verse four. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Now, anyone can say that. That's why there needs to be church leadership covering. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then sailed from the, for the island of Cyprus there in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. Remember, he's the author of the Gospel of Mark. Afterward, they traveled from town to town across the entire island until finally they reached Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Interesting name. I'll explain that in a moment. He had attached himself to the governor, Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. The governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him, for he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, that's the, his Greek version of his name, Bar-Jesus, that's Bar-Jesus is Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew um, transliteration into English. So Elymas is the transliteration from the Greek, and it means sorcerer also. If there's a little difficulty on the translation of that word, but it's a Semitic word that means sorcerer. So in other words, Elymas or Bar-Jesus took on his nickname or his name as sorcerer. In other words, he was proud to be a sorcerer. Probably not a good idea. 
interfered. So this is what he did. Elymas the sorcerer interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul said. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. I also want to warn you of something else. Be careful of people who will attach themselves to you or weasel their way into your life and teach you another gospel. Be on guard. And by the way, how do you know they're teaching a wrong gospel? You know the gospel. You need to know the authentic to find out which one is counterfeit. Now, he's obviously not a believer in Jesus Christ, so he's against Jesus. So he would be considered an antichrist, someone who's against Jesus, not the antichrist, but one like him. The spirit of the antichrist is already in operation in our world. People will come alongside you, but they'll even do it and call themselves Christians. And they will fellowship with you. And they will try to steer you away from listening to the gospel or Jesus, the word, or the pastor that's preaching the word. They will come in and they will weasel their way in and they will even try to make excuses for their sin or justify their lifestyle so that you will fall away with them. The devil uses those people in churches. Have discernment, my friends. Know the gospel. And if someone tries to excuse sin, get away from them immediately. That should be a clap, just in case we all are on the same page. All right? Be, um, um, be warned. Deception will increase in the end times. Okay? We talked about that last, last fall and winter. All right, deception is in an all-time high right now. What does Saul do or Paul do, also known as Paul, verse, verse 9? Filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked at the sorcerer in the eye. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and looked at the sorcerer in the eye. Now, this is important that we know that Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit, not frustration or not, you know, uh, the flesh, The Holy Spirit was prompting him to do this. In other words, God is telling him to do this, okay? And he's a leader of the church. So what I'm about to read, I'm not asking you to start doing this, okay? And there's a different way of handling people in the body of Christ and handling people outside the body of Christ, okay? But sometimes they overlap and you have to deal with it because they're a wolf in sheep's clothing. But verse 10 says, then he said, you son of the devil. Ooh, wow. Hey, Full of every sort of deceit and fraud. There you go. Deceitful people, fraudulent people, an enemy of all that is good. Look out for them in your life. Will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? That was a rhetorical question. Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, so his judgment, and this is temporal judgment for a temporary time, most likely, and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. Instantly, mist and darkness came over the man's eyes, and he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. Wow. Now, is this justified? Is is this okay? Uh, Because, Ryan, you said last week that we should pray for our enemies and bless them and show, you know, pray for mercy upon them. Well, there's a time for everything. And when you're dealing with a demonic influence, there's a certain way to handle that. And this is from a leadership position, someone who is full of the Holy Spirit. Again, I would not do this if you're not being led by the Holy Spirit. But there will be times where you actually are going to rebuke demons in people and call them out. But in this case, this was a sorcerer that was trying to uh, deter the governor from believing the gospel. And he loses as usual, and God takes care of business through Paul. When the governor saw what had happened, verse 12, he became a believer. Now notice this, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. This is important because it's not signs and wonders that we believe in. We believe in the teaching of Jesus Christ. Signs and wonders validate them. So do not rely on signs and wonders for your faith. 
Do not rely on signs and wonders to get people saved. We must couple that with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They preached the gospel. The demonic influence came out through Bar-Jesus, which his name it means son of Jesus. How ironic is that? But it could be rendered child of God. Instead, he was being a child of the devil. He was deceived himself, and now he's trying to deceive everyone else. So Bar-Jesus, or Elymas, was judged, and the point of this was, hopefully, for repentance. Because God could have said, done, you fall on the ground, just like Ananias and Sapphira, when they lied about the gifts they gave God. Boom, done. Fall on the ground dead. He didn't. He showed mercy in this case in hopes that his blindness would actually help him see in his heart and his faith in Jesus Christ. So God was actually showing mercy to the Jewish sorcerer, Elymas, by not striking him dead, but instead blinding him for a temporary time in hopes that he would repent. That's a gracious, merciful God, because he could have done that if he wanted to. He could have done anything he wanted to, but he gave him time to repent. That is the goal here, is for his heart to turn back to the Lord. But what happened here is, is the governor actually believed the teaching the sign, the miracle, which by the way is the first miracle of Paul recorded, the miracle validated their teaching to the governor and it helped him believe. Thank God for that. Well, there's a lot more to cover, so let me keep going, okay? Verse 13, Paul and his companions then left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia, landing at the port town of Perga. There John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. Um, you might find in your version, it might say abandoned them, walked away from them, things like that. I'm going to get into that more in John 15 or uh, Acts 15, uh, where John Mark, uh, there's an argument over him. Uh, but they felt like, Paul felt like John Mark be, uh, abandoned them and left them. And so we're going to look at that later. We'll get back to that. But Paul and Barnabas, they continued, they traveled inland to Antioch of Pisidia, which was the other Antioch up north. And on the Sabbath, they went to the synagogue for the services. And after the usual readings from the books of Moses to the prophets, those in charge of the service sent them this message. Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, come and give it. Oh, my goodness. They gave him an invite. Woo, I would love that. But you know what? God's going to do that for you too. Someone's like, boop, boop, boop. Hey, can you come over? I'm curious about all this faith stuff and the Bible. I see things happening in the world. I have questions. And my friends, please take the call and go do that. Run if you can. Get into a car. Get there as soon as possible. Share what and ask or answer any questions they are asking, okay? So anyway, so Paul stood, lifted his hand to quiet them and started speaking. Men of Israel, he said, and you God-fearing Gentiles, listen to me. So they weren't believers in Christ yet. They just are people who feared God, who believed in God, but not necessarily Jesus. And now he unpacks one of the most powerful short forms of the, the story of the Bible or the gospel. He unpacks the story of the Bible in these verses. And if you ever want to know what you could share with your neighbors, your coworkers, your family members, this is it. Okay? This is a great example. All right, buckle in. Here we go. Whew. Actually, let me get some water. This is a lot of scripture. But listen, I mean, hear me out today. We had at least four young people give their life to Christ in the first service because of this scripture right here. <clears throat> so open your heart to hear the story of God and your story with him. It could be your story next. All right, what he's done for you. The God of this nation of Israel chose our ancestors and made them multiply and grow strong during their stay in Egypt. Then with a powerful arm, he led them out of their slavery. He put up with them. <laughs> That's funny. He put up with them through 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. He sure did. Then he destroyed seven nations in Canaan and gave their land to Israel as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. 
After that, God gave them judges to rule until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people begged for a king, and God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, who reigned for 40 years. But God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He would do everything I want him to do. Of course, he wasn't perfect either in the end. It is, it is one of King David's descendants, Jesus. So Jesus comes from the line of David, who is God's promised savior of Israel. So he's connecting the dots here for all these Jewish believers who believed in, in God and the God of Jacob, and the God of David. Before he came, John the Baptist preached that all the people of Israel need to repent of their sins and turn to God and be baptized. As John was finishing his ministry, he asked, do you think I'm the Messiah? No, I'm not, but he is coming soon. And I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the sandals on his feet. Brothers, you sons of Abraham and, you, and also you God-fearing Gentiles, this message of salvation has been sent to us. The people in Jerusalem and their leaders did not recognize Jesus as the one the prophets had spoken about. Instead, they condemned him. In doing this, they fulfilled the prophet's words that are read every Sabbath. They found no legal reason to execute him, but they asked Pilate to have him killed anyway. So Jesus died for us, even though he was innocent. And when they had done all that the prophecy said about him, they took him down from the cross and placed him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And over a period of many days, he appeared to those who had gone with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to the people of Israel. And now we are here to bring you this good news. The promise was made to our ancestors and God has now fulfilled it for us their descendants by raising Jesus. This is what the second Psalm says about Jesus. You are my son. Today I've become your father. For God had promised to raise him from the dead, not leaving him to rot in the grave. He said, I will give you the sacred blessings I promised to David. Another Psalm explains it more fully. You will not allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. Ah, see, Jesus came back to life. This is not a reference to David, for after David had done the will of God in his own generation, he died and was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. So this couldn't be about David. This had to be about the Messiah. That's what he's trying to say. No, it was a reference to someone else, someone whom God raised and whose body did not decay. Brothers, listen. We are here to proclaim, and listen carefully, church, that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins and my sins. There is no other name by which we can be saved except through faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, you're a sinner. I'm a sinner and we all need Jesus. And Jesus came for all who would believe. And so today, if that's you, Maybe, maybe God still needs to change your heart towards your sin. Maybe you don't. And this is important. I, and I feel like I need to press this. Maybe you don't feel bad about your sin. I can't force you to. I can't make you to, to feel bad for it. I can't make you feel guilty. If you're not feeling guilty for sin, I would ask for the Holy Spirit to come and convict you. I would ask for God to convict you. I'd rather you feel guilt for your sin than never feel guilt. Because if you can, you will confess your sins and give your life to Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 39 says, everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight. So you're, you're made holy. You're made righteous if you believe in Jesus something the law of Moses could never do. So he's talking to these God-fearing Jews and God-fearing Gentiles who may have observed Judaism. And he's saying what, what Moses' law did was only for a time. It could never do. It could never wash us on the inside out. It can never save us. It has to be the grace of Jesus Christ that saves us. And he says, be careful. Don't let the prophet's words apply to you. For they said, look, you mockers, be amazed and die. For I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. If I told you that you could go to heaven, 
you could be forgiven of sin and go to heaven. And it wasn't anything you did, but it was actually everything Jesus did. And it was a free gift of salvation. If I told you that that was for you, would you believe it? And would you believe that sin sends us to hell? But grace gets us to heaven. The grace of Jesus. Would you believe that? Would you believe that there is a heaven and a hell? Would you believe that there is a judgment day? Would you believe these things if they were said to you and that you don't have to pay your way in? You can't live a perfect life to get in. All you can do is accept the perfect righteousness of Jesus on you. And will you believe that he'll actually give you a new heart and a new mind to actually live for him and stop doing the things you used to do? Do you believe that you can let go of addictions and believe you can leave your old past behind? Do you believe that? Because it's true today. You're standing or sitting in a room right now where Jesus has done that for those people here in this room. Do you believe that? Brian, I don't know. I'm so in it. I'm so deep into my sin, my addictions. I can't get out of it. There are people in this room who would prove you otherwise because Jesus has done it for them. It's our testimony by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. We are saved. We are a different person. Do not listen to the enemy. Do not listen to the bar Jesus in your ears who's trying to get you to not believe today. I don't know, I don't know who I'm, I'm fighting against here, and I'm not saying you personally. I know there's unseen spiritual forces trying to stop you today. And God is trying to crush that evil unseen spirit and get you to believe today that he loves you, he forgives you, and he will help you live a brand new life. Amen. As you can imagine, the next verse makes a lot of sense. As verse 42, as Paul and Barnabas left the synagogue that day, the people begged them to speak about these things again the next week. They're like, that was good. You got to come back. <laughs> Many Jews and, a devout, and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, and the two men urged them, you right for this, to continue to rely on the grace of God. So in other words, they believed they had actually believed in Jesus Christ. Some, some biblical scholars aren't sure. Some say, ah, maybe not yet. And then some say, no, if he would say the grace of God here instead of the law of Moses, then they believe. So I, I would say, after that, I would believe, but you never know because we're dealing with people's lives and some people are resistant and we're going to see that in a moment. But I would lean into, yes, they did believe. And so now they're saying, until we get back, continue in the grace of God. Continue to walk out your new faith, okay? I don't think we need to get in the weeds on that that much because then a great harvest happens anyway. Verse 44, the following week, almost the entire city turned out to hear them preach the word of the Lord. How cool was that? But when some of the Jews saw the crowds, they were jealous. So they slandered Paul and urged against whatever he said. Mm. That's the evil, unseen spiritual realm that's going on. In the spiritual realm, the unseen evil forces can also manifest itself in physical resistance through people. So yes, we don't wrestle with, wrestle with flesh and blood, so to say, we wrestle with the powers and the uh, spiritual powers of the unseen realm and the evil powers of the devil and his demons. Yes, we wrestle with them, but unfortunately some people give their lives to that. And so now we see it physically in this story. And you see a contrast here in a moment because what they do is now they slander Paul. And then they urge against everything he's teaching. They're trying to sway people's thinking because they're jealous. There's a jealous spirit in them, an evil spirit in them because they walk with the world instead of with God. Beware of people who slander your church leadership or slander you or slander your friends that go here or go to another church. Beware of them. We shouldn't be doing that. Beware of that. Okay, let's go on. Then Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and declared, 
It was necessary that we first preach the word of God to you Jews. But since you have rejected it, he starts laying down the hammer here again. Since you have rejected it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Yikes. Why? Because they resisted. We will offer it to the Gentiles, to those who are not Jews. For the Lord gave us this command when he said, I have made you a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the farthest corners of the earth. See, Paul knew his call from the first three verses till now. He knows he's called to bring the gospel now to the Gentiles. And he will preach to the Jews too. We actually see that in in the book of Acts. He will preach to the Jews too. But now the door has been opened to all people, not just the chosen people, the Israelites. Okay? And that's important for the context, what's coming up. Verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they were very glad and thanked the Lord for his message because they were open and receptive. The Gentiles were open and receptive to the Lord's plan to open them, the door to them. And all who were chosen for eternal life became believers. So the Lord's message spread throughout that region. Now that's an important line right there. And all who were chosen for eternal life became believers. There's, I don't have time to get into this. There's a major theological debates on this verse and other verses in the Bible. But here's what we know. The Lord had always planned to open the door to all people. The Bible says that he wished that none shall perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible also says, whoever believes in me, whosoever believes in me will have eternal life. The Bible is open to all people. Too many people have taken this verse too far. They have taught and interpreted, and I know I'm coming against a large camp, but I sit in a different camp. A large camp would say, God has already chosen you, and that's why you believed. And I disagree with that teaching. Because Jesus is the way for all people to be saved. The word all means all people. But the responsibility is on mankind to believe or not, to receive or not. You see, the door was immediately open right here to the Gentiles. And what it's saying is, is God decreed that the Gentiles could be saved and they believed. And so the ones in that town believe. Now, I do believe that God foreknows all things and God knows who will believe, but that God doesn't make you believe. He does not. It is a choice. It is a decision. That's important. And there's two reasons why. First of all, the reason why I stand in that camp, that he didn't choose some to be saved and some to go to hell, because that would make God responsible for you going to hell, not your sin not your unbelief. Wow. So I disagree with that teaching because we must be responsible whether we believe or not. Okay? That way the responsibility is on us and not God as the one that decreed us going to hell. It's called double predestination. So I disagree with that teaching. And I agree with the teaching that the door is open for all people and that you are elected in the Son. So if you put your faith in Jesus, you are now the elect, or now you are part of the family of God. You're adopted. All right? Now that's key. And um, look, I'll, one day I hope to get into the deeper teachings of these debates. But all we know is in this moment, those that were allowed, or so to say, the door opened to be saved, they believed. The Gentiles believed. And by the way, that was always God's heart. And Jesus already started ministering to Gentiles before they did. And it's in all in the Old Testament as well, how the door was going to be open to all people. Wow, this is some good stuff, isn't it? Interesting scriptures. Well, the Lord's message spread throughout that region, verse 49. The whole region, the Lord's message spread. So there was a fire of the gospel. And verse 50 says, then the Jews... This is random. This is so random. Luke gives some interesting details sometimes. Then the Jews stirred up influential religious women and the leaders of the city, and they incited a mob against Paul and Barnabas and ran them out of town. 
So they shook the dust, the Paul and Barnabas shook the dust from their feet as a sign of rejection and went to the town of Iconium. And the believers were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So the gospel spread. The believers were filled with uh, joy and the Holy Spirit, which are in tandem. They come together. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're joyful. If you're joyful, it's because you got the Holy Spirit in you, living in you. And there were some religious women in that day who were prominent women who probably had prominent, uh, they were prominent citizens of that community and they had influence and them and other Jewish prominent people at this time, they formed an alliance against Paul and Barnabas. And so Paul and Barnabas had to shake their feet off, kick the dust off their feet or their hands as a sign of you're not willing to receive, you don't want to believe. And so we're going to go elsewhere. And it doesn't mean they gave up. They entrusted those people into the grace of God and whether his mercy and what he could do for them or for another time. But I want to go back to something because it's not just that, that God wouldn't uh, condemn you or I to hell and some to heaven, but also there's another reason why it takes faith from us and responsibility on us because the Jews were the chosen people if they were chosen by God, they should have believed, and they didn't. See, not all believed. And so we need to interpret Scripture with Scripture here. In the context of our Scripture, God's chosen people didn't even believe in Jesus. They rejected him. By the way, they crucified him. So it takes faith in Jesus. And I love that God has given us the word. And what does the word say? That when you lift up my son, I would draw all men to myself. Or what does he say about how can they know? How can they hear? How can they believe if you are not sent to preach the gospel? We must go and preach the gospel so that the gospel will work in hearts, so that the Holy Spirit will come upon people and they would have the faith to believe. They would break down the hard hearts and that they would soften themselves to receive the gospel. The Gentiles were so grateful that they brought the gospel to them. They were receptive and ready to receive. And the Jews, well, they were once again inciting a mob against the gospel. And so you're going to run into that in our world. Well, I have, I have run out of time. But I think I've taught a lot of stuff that we need to know my, our notes are online. If you need to read them, I have some more study notes on these difficult subjects in there as well uh, at calvarydover.org, and it's in uh, sermons or articles. Let me give you a few takeaways to close. Can we go back to the beginning of that scripture uh, just in our, in our hearts and our minds right now? When did they get called to go? When they were in the presence of the Lord, worshiping, fasting, and praying. So number one, value and prioritize dwelling in the presence of God. My friends, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to be in a dedicated, consecrated time with the Lord on a regular basis. It is from the altar with God. It is from the secret place that we spend time with God that he confirms and affirms everything in our lives. God's love for you, he affirms that when you hang out with him. God's direction for you, he affirms that through the Holy Spirit and even the people of God. They were in community praying together, not alone. We need to do that too. We have a prayer night coming up on Wednesday night. We need to pray together. We need to be there for each other. God may give a word from someone else and, and confirm everything you needed to know. It happened at one of our last prayer meetings. He's doing it over and over again. Listen, we need to get so close to God, we can hear him whisper. He loves the whisper, by the way. He, he can shout. He can, he can definitely be louder than everyone else all the voices that we hear. But he loves to whisper because that means you've gotten close to him. He wants to be close to you. He doesn't want to yell at you from a distance. 
Spend time with him. And my friends, do not make decisions about your life unless you're in a consecrated time with the Lord like this. It was from that time with God that they were sent out. If we're going to be a light to those around us, we must be in the presence of God and let him guide and speak to us. Let him encourage us. Let his word teach us and affirm what we need to know for that day for us and for the people we're going to come in contact with. I don't know how many times I read a scripture and I thought, man, I was hoping to get a little something for me today. And then that day, it wasn't for me. It was for someone else. And I was just thinking about myself too much. Instead of thinking about the people I would run into, we need to spend time with God. Can I say this too? We can't afford not to spend time with God. We can't afford that. You see this world and what we're going through in it? Are you serious? We're going to ignore quality time with God and prayer and worship and fasting in the word? We cannot do what we need to do and what's coming upon America in this world. We won't be able to handle it without God. I think you get my point. Persecution's on its way even more and more. Resistance and rejection of the gospel is on its way more and more. Let me, quickly, let me go to the next one. Evangelism takes time. They took their time. They came back. They stayed there. A lot of times we don't read the, the, the long time that Paul stayed in a place, but he stayed in some places for years to plant churches. If you can build relationships with people, you build uh, this relationship that gives you a chance to care, to love, not just to preach. Come on now. Come on now. Like, I agree with street evangelism. I totally agree. I've done it, and I do it. And I, I also agree with building relationship, relational evangelism. But I'm not going to just preach the gospel and not try to show love and care at the same time. We got to do both, my friends. People are not projects. They're people. They need the tender love and care at the same time as we share the truth because it's the truth of God is it, it can hurt. And it's okay. It's the way it is. It calls you out. But we got to take time and build relationships with people. Don't overlook or underestimate the relational evangelism in your life. And then, hey, it's a both and thing. Talk to people about Jesus on the street. We're called to walk across the street. We're called to walk across the room and share. And here's what I do. Real quick, evangelism training. All right, real quick. I get to know their story. I get to know their life. Usually they want to know my life and my story, so I share my story. And you know who's big in my life, right? You know who's at the center of my life is Jesus. So guess whose name is going to come out? And then guess what? I'm going to start asking some questions about their thoughts on Jesus. And do they know what Jesus did for them? And then I'm going to let the conversation go there. And then the Holy Spirit is going to lead me on sharing something just like what Paul said here in our scripture. And you know what? If they reject it, they do. If they accept it, they do. Or if they want to wait, they do. That's fine. It's all good. I got time for now. We all have time until the Lord comes back or until we pass away. Thirdly, trust the gospel to work. You don't need to come up with some three-step, you know, motivational speech to get people to believe. The Holy Spirit convicts, the Holy Spirit works through the preaching and teaching of the gospel and even your testimony because you weave the gospel into it and how Jesus changed your life. Trust the gospel to work. Paul was a, uh, to me, the guy was a genius. I mean, this guy was so brilliant. People didn't understand some of the stuff he said. And yet he just told the simple story of the Bible. Trust the gospel to work. Fourth, some will reject and some will accept Jesus. Don't get discouraged when they reject and don't take it personal because Jesus said they will hate you because they will hate you because they hated me first. Or they reject God. They're not rejecting you. Don't make it about you. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. And if someone rejects your sharing of the gospel, it's okay. It's going to be all right. The gospel is still saving and working in other people's lives. 
And lastly, and you can stand with me, don't be surprised by spiritual and physical resistance. Let me stand together. Don't be surprised by spiritual and physical resistance. I just want to thank God. I want to thank God for whoever didn't give up on my grandmother and my grandfather. I want to thank God that she was receptive too. I want to thank God that someone continued to pray for my grandmother and my grandfather and share the gospel with them. Because of that, my parents became Christians. And because of that, we have a church here that's thriving and growing and ministering to other people. And you can say the same about your family members. Someone in the midst of rejection or even spiritual resistance, someone kept going. It wasn't time to, to dust off their feet or their hands. And, and we believed, and your family members believed. And can we just thank God for a moment for the people before us who led us to the Lord? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Today, if you're in this room and you didn't know that Jesus gave his all for you. Jesus gave his all. Talk about Memorial Day weekend. We give our all for our country and for for the sacrifices of our fellow brothers and sisters and the armed services and forces. And Jesus did something for you for eternity. He gave his all. He stretched out his arms for you. And if you believe that you are a sinner, but most of all believe Jesus Christ forgives you of your sin, like you actually have to agree with that. If you agree with that, I want you to know something really good news today. He forgives you. He wants to start a brand new, fresh start with you, a new life with you. And he will give you his Holy Spirit to help you do what pleases him, to help you live for him. And this morning, I asked people to raise their hand in front of everyone and not for people to see you, but for us to be able to pray for you because we prayed for them. And would you know, out of the five people who raised their hand, four of them, three of them were teenagers and one of them was a young adult. A young generation is rising up that believes in Jesus Christ, that knows they need Jesus. Amen. So, I'm going to ask you to do the same. And I know many of us have believed in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior for the forgiveness of our sins. If we do that, we will be made righteous and he will help us live a holy, righteous life. If you've never done that in your life and today you're here and you're saying, I want to give my life to Jesus and I'm willing to boldly proclaim that in front of everyone, would you raise your hand right now like this and just hold it up? Wow. One, two, three. It's, yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Would you extend hands out to those people who raise hands, church? And would those of you who raise your hands and we can help them pray, would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, I am a sinner, but you're the forgiver of sins. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty tomb. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins to make me a new person, a new creation in Christ. And give me your Holy Spirit to help me follow you. And I will give you my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's clap and praise the Lord for that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. 